Great. So I'm not sure if everybody's back in person or even on the Zoom, but I think there's so many messages and lovely New Year's resolutions coming in that uh, I didn't really want to call it that, aspirations, um, that it'd be nice to start on a few. So as I said, I won't be able to get through everything, but I'll just read a few out to see if we can inspire one another and rejoice in the goodness of our wishes for the year ahead. So can everybody... Recording in progress. <laughs> so the recording only just started. Now we're reading out people's aspirations, something to let go of and something to take forward into the new year. So uh, I'll start with someone from Zoom. One thing I'd like to let go of is being hard on myself and others, judging others. I would like to carry forward more compassion towards all and having a greater sense of peace within myself. <laughs> And the next one, letting go of excessive control. Don't seem to be able to scroll. Hmm. May I be a safe haven of kindness and emptiness for all beings everywhere. Letting go of perfectionism. Lovely. Breathing in emptiness, breathing out contentment. Welcoming in trust and faith. Let go dark usher in light. Oh, <laughs> let go of dark usher in the light. That sounds better. <laughs> Otherwise it sounds like a weird priest or something. <laughs> okay, I, I don't think I can scroll. Can you, Julia? Can you scroll down? Oh. Okay, so I'll take one from the box from the people here. Letting go of feeling that I don't have control and cultivating or remembering kindness. Doesn't. Yeah, maybe there aren't. Oh, yeah. Let go of judgment, bring in generosity. Does that make any difference to the mic? People are saying it's more muffled. Maybe that's too far away. Maybe put it here. How's that? Is that any better? I can't speak too much louder without shouting. <laughs> okay. Oh, I like this. Transform crap into crop. I don't really want to shout that one, but... I ended up shouting a bad word. <laughs> In other words, suffering into joy through love. <laughs> That's what Ajahn Brown means by um, using shit to fertilize the mango trees. That's an even worse word, isn't it? <laughs> uh, letting go of addictions like unhealthy food and mindless internet browsing. Yes. I know all about that. <laughs> Letting go of judgment. Um, something else that I'm not sure about. And being unmindful with money. I can't understand the second word there. Bringing in unconditional happiness, health, uh, financial ease and... Uh, something else. Can you read that? At the bottom. Something mysterious. <laughs> okay. Letting go of expectations of receiving happiness from others' actions and bringing in inner contentment. That's lovely. Sorry, I have to go through them a bit quickly. Developing better self meta kindfulness and balance letting go of the inner critic of oneself less self more mind To let go of stress and worry and bring in more practice of 
Hmm. Cut this off. Jeez, can you read that? No. <laughs> Does anybody know if that's theirs? No? Okay. Hmm. I'm curious. When I can't read something, it makes me more curious. Okay. Uh, can everybody hear me? Better now? Yeah? All right. Giving up self-loathing and embracing open-heartedness. Mm. Five more minutes. Practice noticing when being judgmental and convert it to acceptance. I intend to say thank you to myself more often. It's really nice. I don't know if I ever say thank you to myself. Does anyone else? Sometimes? <laughs> Letting go as much non-ahimsa as possible. So as much... Anything that's not gentle and non-violent. And letting in more meditation, more joy, more being okay with whatever arises, and a few nice massages or self-care. <laughs> okay. Letting go of anxiety, living in the now. That's from Zoom. Letting go of resistance and fear. And I'll read the bit you want to bring in in a second. I think there's more. Uh, letting go of expectations and visit more retreats than this year. Excellent. So you're a good candidate for the Sheffield Tr <laughs> Insight Trust. <laughs> so letting go of resistance and fear, cultivating gentleness and acceptance. Mm, that's nice. It makes me think that resistance is a, perhaps a lack of gentleness as well. <laughs> Letting go of artificial self-imposed limits. Having confidence in my teachings. That's not me. There's other teachers here, hidden in the room. <laughs> uh. To find contentment in being single. Single is so nice. Oh, it's such a relief, no? Not to have to take care of another five candles. You've got your body, mind, perception. Imagine having to take care of another person's as well or worry about them. It's so nice to be single. <laughs> so you can reflect on all the blessings of being single and all the troubles that you avoid. It's the same for married people. I could say that for you as well. <laughs> Letting go of unnecessary clutter and cultivating rest. To cultivate rest and appreciate it as meta for everyone. Yay! When you rest, that's meta for everyone. The Buddha says, the Buddha used to say, that he would rest out of compassion for the world. That's really nice, isn't it? That gives you a good permission. So now everyone's going to be snoring during the next <laughs> session. I would like to let go of my compulsion to control. I would like to be more open hearted. Yeah. I like that because it's not saying I will, but it's saying I would like because we can't just immediately change, but we can intend to change. And I always think if we value things like open-heartedness, it means we already do have it. We know what it means. We're almost through, actually, which is lovely. We can get through everyone. I would like to give up expectation from other people. And in the coming year, uh, my purpose or something, to be kind and charitable for 
for others. So yeah, to be kind and charitable toward others this year. Hmm. That's nice. To let go of fixing people. <laughs> it's so honest, isn't it? And to bring into life practice. Wonderful. <laughs> that includes oneself as we're a person as well. <laughs> what comes after freedom? Question mark. If you're free, you'll find out. <laughs> Or maybe that's what you want to find out. Anyway. More joyfulness and letting go of efforting. Yay. Any more from Zoom because we're on the last one here. So if you do have something to add, now's your chance. And finding contentment from within instead of hoping it will come from others. Hmm. Wonderful. So it seems like people have learned a lot or they were already wise because these are really beautiful aspirations. How nice. Sometimes hearing other people's I think helps us become clearer for ourselves as well. So hopefully that was inspiring for everyone here. Any more comments people want to make? No. All right. I wonder if I can see the other pages. I'm just going to flick through and see your faces because it's really nice to see that there's like loads of people. Oh, look, all these people that I know. Hi. <laughs> Very nice. And Oh, people are turning on their video. That's nice. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Oh. <laughs> Very good. All right, so I'm going to leave this screen and appear from a slightly different angle. And uh, we'll have a little Dhamma reflection and then probably some quiet meditation since you all know so many ways to practice now. So we'll do that now. Thank you very much, everybody. It's really touching. <laughs> <laughs> when I ordained in uh, Myanmar many years ago, 17 years now, I never expected I'd be like fitted up with wires and having like <laughs> two different cameras and a screen beside me. It was like, it was an act of disappearing. <laughs> and the purpose over there, one of the reasons that it's so nice to um, take the robes is that you disappear, you know, you actually um, look like every other nun in the line. We had a pink robes at that time, sort of a saffron color actually with like an, this color uh, piece over the shoulder and a bright orange under robe and we all look the same except I mean I was whiter than most but uh, it's really a sort of disappearing act and now it's the opposite thing but in a way that's also a renunciation because it's totally against my character actually believe it or not to sit here and talk to the group so it's quite interesting ordaining because you basically have to let go into whatever life asks of you at any given time Anyway, that aside, looking at my little screens <laughs> for the sake of spreading a bit of Dhamma, hopefully, I wanted to just recap on what we've done together for the last uh, three days. And some of us are here for the first time today. Um, I think there's quite a few newcomers on the, the Zoom, but maybe it's helpful to just recap on um, the different perspectives really of loving kindness and how we've applied that to the practice um, of deepening our samadhi and also the breath meditation. Okay, so we looked at metta mostly and we looked at it firstly as an attitude or a way of relating to our minds, to our bodies, to our breath, to life in general. And we also looked at it as a practice in and of itself. So we were working with the loved person and also working with metta towards ourself and um, talking about metta a little bit as a practice that can take you pretty much all the way <laughs> um, through developing deep states of samadhi. And obviously it has that special attribute of joy, a lot of joy and a special sort of um, quality of opening the heart, really softening the mind and the heart toward others and overcoming these boundaries we put up between one another 
and uh, even the boundaries and barriers we put up towards accepting ourselves. And uh, that metta can also be used from the deep states of meditation to understand the conditioned nature of the states of samadhi themselves and in that way lead to wisdom. So we also looked at metta as a perception, a training in perception to soften the mind and to start viewing one another with more kindly, generous eyes. And then also as a preparation for the breath meditation. And that's what we've been mostly kind of uh, working with. A preparation, but also a way of looking at that breath when it does come to mind. So metta is not ever taught in a vacuum or shouldn't be taught in a vacuum as something additional or kind of superfluous to the path. It's not just a soft practice for those who can't do the real vipassana. It's actually part and parcel of the Eightfold Path. So the right intention, the right motivations of loving kindness, gentleness, letting go are an outcome of wisdom. You know, they're a natural response when we understand and appreciate the suffering in the world and the suffering within ourselves. And they're a beautiful response that's full of uh, wisdom because we have to know how to respond and what's an appropriate way to try to help. So it's part of the Eightfold Path and it's also, um, because it's one of the right motivations, it undermines the wrong motivations of greed, hate and delusion. It's a direct antidote to the aversion, to the sense of, uh, you can call it hate, that's a very strong word, but it just means anything, any sort of movement of the mind that pulls away from something, like is repelled from an object or repelled from a person or an emotional state. So that kind of aversion and negativity that we have towards things we don't like and delusion as well. And it also manifests as sila. I very rarely quote uh, anyone actually other than the Buddha and the Buddhist teachings, but the, the Buddhist teachers um, that I respect. But there is a lovely quote, I think, by Kilu Gibran, I think. And uh, I also thought this was relevant in the context of service being a part of the path. And he says, work is love made visible. And I think that's so lovely. You could also say service is love made visible. So that metta not only does manifest in acts of kindness and service and really going out of your way to help others, but it's also, um, it's also a kind of test of whether it's really metta, whether it's really compassion or not. And the Buddha said that he taught out of Anukampa, that's the name of our project as well, out of Anukampa for the world which is basically a sense of compassion and a sense of empathy that seeks to act for the benefit and welfare of all beings. So something inside us has to start to stir, you know, and to actually want to give of ourselves. And also metta changes the conditioned patterns of our mind because we can start to reprogram our thoughts from less helpful thoughts to thoughts more connected with the good of others and the good of ourselves thoughts of harmlessness, thoughts of renunciation, letting go, letting go of clinging, letting go of control, as many people here have aspired to do. It's interesting actually how many of the um, things people want to bring forward were related to letting go of control and judgment and kind of fixing themselves and fixing other people. That really resonated to me as an aspect of metta, you know, that we stop putting people and ourselves in boxes and we actually endeavor to accept and embrace people and ourselves just as we are, including the emotions that we find difficult or the mental states. You know, sometimes people have an idea that because they're Buddhist or because we're Buddhist, if you identify that way, which I never used to, I was telling Marianne, um, I just kind of couldn't keep saying I'm not a Buddhist really once I'd shaved my head <laughs> and taken the robes. But I'm not on anything, you know, this is a process and what I do is try to follow the Buddha's teachings as best I can in a way that brings about benefit and happiness for me. So, um, forget what I was saying now, my train of thought. Anyone else? Yeah. But it's not feeling difficult states of mind. Oh yeah, that's right. So somebody on the Zoom said that someone told them that because they're a Buddhist they shouldn't grieve or they shouldn't be sad or something like this. 
Um, but I mean, just whatever label you put on yourself doesn't change the course of nature because everything that arises is just a product of cause and effect. And when we lose something we love or we lose someone we love, as long as we're not fully enlightened, there's going to be grief. You know, these things are really natural. And that metta doesn't seek to push them away, it seeks to embrace. And it gives us a sense of resilience, a sense of um, resourcedness that allows us to receive these things and relate to them kindly, relate to them wisely and gently. So we learn to handle our mind rather than kind of force it to be this way or that. So not only can we reprogram the mind in wholesome ways, we also can use metta to condition the mind, like as in a conditioner. So to soften out those knots in the mind, I like to think of metta like conditioner. I don't know why, but it takes out all the knots and tangles, you know, like in your hair. Um, it takes away all the thorny bushes and the things you can trip up on. So metta is, uh, it smooths the path. So another aspect of, of loving kindness that I wanted to touch into briefly before I give some suggestions for daily practice is also loving kindness as a way to help the letting go. So again, many people talked about things they want to relinquish, let go of, um, settle. You could say settle down, make peace with. And metta can really help with this. And for those who know a little bit about uh, the Buddha's teachings and the Four Noble Truths, the Buddha said that the cause of suffering is craving, clinging, and the way out of suffering are basically the antidotes to that. So there are four ways of letting go that the Buddha taught, and they're called chaga, the first one, and that means giving, generosity, giving away, giving up. So I really like this one because this is less of the sense of just letting go into this sort of what do you let go into and it's more of an active giving so there's something very warm about it and I think metta helps with this as we were saying you know metta can be used to motivate acts of service and charity and kindness so we give of ourselves like we can give to the breath right we can give our mind to the breath we can give our trust to the breath we can give this moment to the breath Sometimes when I meditate, I imagine that I'm just giving this meditation to the Buddha or to my teacher. You know, sometimes it feels like a hopeless time to sit. My mind's spinning or I'm really, really tired. And there's nothing I can really get from the meditation and I'm not concerned with gain. So instead I think about giving, you know, I just give this time because it's a good thing to do. And that alone can bring happiness into the mind because we're freeing ourselves of expectation, you know, we're freeing ourselves from needing to acquire or attain. And happiness comes quite readily to a person who finds joy in giving, right? There's many opportunities to give. So it's a beautiful source of happiness in our lives. And then the next one is called Pati Nisaga, and this is very similar to what we described as Nekama, renunciation or letting go. It's pretty much the same word. It's giving away, letting go of things, abandoning, and especially abandoning those unwholesome states of mind, abandoning clinging itself. And this one is actually part of the fourth stage of Anapana, which I'm determined to just touch on. Uh, so you have the complete Anapana Sati Sutta. Um, and this is in the Sutta a result of seeing impermanence, having some understanding of impermanence as a result of deep meditation. And that impermanence, seeing the impermanence, the next stage is that things start to fade. So I know for me in, uh, in my Vipassana meditation, you know, when you would start to see the body as impermanent, it would start to get subtler and subtler and subtler and all the solidity would vanish. Things would start to fade. Similarly, in breath meditation, the breath starts to fade, right? You can see it's impermanent, it's coming in and going out, but after a while it starts to change, of course, become softer, but also it can really slow down and actually seem to disappear for a while. So it fades and then it ceases. 
and that's the second and third stage of that tetrad. So the impermanence leads to fading, which leads to ceasing, and then to the letting go, which obviously would be very natural if something's faded away and stopped. So in the case of the breath meditation, the breath can actually come to a stop, you know, and the, even the sensations in the body can, can cease and fade. And then we're just um, entering the world of the mind. And as I said earlier, you know, the, there can be great insight from those experiences too, because we realize that even those states of deep meditation eventually fade away. They're also conditioned. They're not the goal itself. They're not something to strive for. You could even say they're not that meaningful in and of themselves as isolated experiences unless they lead to that letting go and unless they lead to wisdom, right? Unless they lead to that opening of the heart. So this is really the purpose of our practice. It's not to gain, but to give away. And then the third kind of letting go is called muti, which means freedom. And I like to think of this in terms of love as well, sort of freeing other people from our expectations, freeing ourselves from our own expectations, which are usually utterly unrealistic and much uh, higher than we have expectations for others. <laughs> I don't know if that's true for everyone here, but I certainly see that in me. So love really gives things freedom. It doesn't try to control or possess. You know, we can say we love people, but if it leads into a sort of control, it can actually turn more into something more like abuse. Because people have to be free to grow in their way. And just as our meditation has to be free to grow in its own time, you know, so we give things freedom, we give ourselves freedom. And that's, of course, easier when we understand the laws of cause and effect when we understand that whatever's arising now is the result of causes. There's no other way it could be. So we're able to free ourselves from unnecessary expectations or wanting to fix and just relax with what's there. So we give the breath freedom to come in or to go out. You know, sometimes we think with breath meditation, it's terrible if we lose the breath or if the mind wanders away. But if we really have loving kindness, that's not so much our goal, you know, our goal is to relate to whatever the situation is with a sense of kindness and non-judgment, making good comer in our meditation practice. And lastly, the fourth type of letting go is called analia. And this is really lovely because it's related to the world. Alia means like a abode, like a place. And uh, Himalaya, in the Indian mountains, the Himalayas are the abodes of snow. So Hima is like snow, and Alaya is like um, abode, literally. And this Analia means no abode, no resting place, nowhere for things to stick. So Ajahn Brahm describes this very nicely as like a Teflon mind. So nothing really sticks to it. You know, you don't hold grudges, you don't hold resentment. You're just able to let things go. And metta helps with that, of course, because we widen the mind and we widen um, our goodwill towards all beings, no matter what they do or who they are. So it's also like the lotus. There's a, this simile of the lotus that's very common in, in Buddhism. And the lotus is this flower which apparently doesn't absorb water. So whatever you pour onto the lotus, it just trickles off. Don't we have something in Derbyshire or we're in Yorkshire now, aren't we? But I come from Derbyshire anyway. And they say like water off a duck's back or something like that. <laughs> well, it might be Yorkshire, but I'm not going to attempt a Sheffield accent. I'm sure it's similar to mine. Uh, so it's kind of like that. It's being the duck that can just shake off the, the water or the other things that people might pour onto you. So you're ready to forgive. You're ready to refresh and begin with a clean slate. And this is really our invitation, especially on a New Year's Eve, right? To take the beauty, take the goodness of the last year in your heart, really value it and appreciate it and just let go of anything like old mistakes or grudges as far as you can, you know? You can determine not to bring them along with you or not to repeat them again, but you know, just focusing on those beautiful things can be enough to incline the mind in wholesome ways. So, 
just to end with a few notes on ongoing practice, um, in general, I would say, uh, especially for people with busy lives, and also at the beginning of meditation retreats, at the beginning of the path in general, it can be more important to give emphasis to developing the right motivation, the right way of relating to ourselves, to our practice in the beginning, than getting on to the breath or than, you know, focusing on an object, a particular object of meditation. So in the beginning, make that the important thing, because once we have the right motivation, everything else tends to fall in place in time. So it's bringing those qualities to bear in everything we do, in the way we relate to one another, the way we relate to our practice. And don't worry so much, especially if you are busy, about getting still or getting onto the breath or whatever it is, because as long as you're relating with kindness, you are developing the path. And that kindness can be added to mindfulness. And you can use that toward the body to heal disease, to heal sickness, tiredness, you know, just kindly letting things be. So give yourself a break whenever you can, you know. And meta practice is particularly helpful for those small times that you have in your day when you feel it's not long enough to go and meditate on a cushion. And you don't really know what to do with your mind. It's very tempting to pick up the mobile and start mm. <laughs> before you know it, it's like two hours went by and you feel absolutely wrecked and you've got a big headache. So instead of that, you can notice, oh, I'm a bit restless now. May I be happy. May I be safe. May I be content. May I be at ease. And we can just have a few moments of well-wishing toward ourselves, you know. Just even noticing, we can also use phases of compassion. Oh, at this moment I'm feeling stressed or I'm feeling overwhelmed. May I just care for myself in this moment, you know. And you don't have to say it and you don't have to be like, oh, may I care for myself? Because <laughs> people can find that a bit, you know, a bit kind of, what? But it's just that they're just words to express a kind of intention that we can remember to have towards ourselves at those times, to be a little bit tenderer, a little bit more gentle and not just rush to the next thing to do. And it's really hard, but it helps, you know, when you come to meditate, if you've put the brakes on a few times during the day. The car won't be going as fast when you sit down. And I'm not a car. Men usually use that similar. <laughs> Ajahn Brahm uses this simile of the body as a vehicle quite a lot. But anyway, it is quite a good one in terms of the speeding mind. So when you come to sit down, if you have put those brakes on at various times and at those times incline the mind towards thoughts that are wise and skillful, thoughts of loving kindness, then it'll be a little bit less jarring when you sit on the cushion. One of my teachers put it nicely. He said it was, um, it's like you're tidying your cupboard throughout the day. So you've got these different shelves and um, instead of just shoving all your dirty laundry on one shelf and it's all mixed up with the stuff that's ironed or I don't know, in my case, the lower robe mixed up with the another robe. Instead of that, and you go to the cupboard, open the door and it all falls on you, you see to folding it throughout the day you know you order it a little bit so the dirty stuff's at the bottom and the clean stuff's in the middle and the sheets are on the top or whatever so when you open your cupboard it's a little less daunting and you kind of know where things are so in a similar way when you return to these wholesome thoughts again and again and then you sit to meditate you remember oh yeah i have a shelf where i keep the loving kindness <laughs> i can go there quite easily and take that meta out you know, you're not just faced with a big mess. And that's kind of called sense restraint. That's what we mean. I don't really go for the word restraint so much, although that's often the translation. It's more like guarding the mind, guarding the way we use our mind, the way we um, perceive and uh, attend to things in our lives. You know, we can, we can look for the negatives or we can look for the things to be grateful for. So if we use our mind skillfully in daily life, it's much, much easier to sit down and, and have a fairly orderly mind. And then, of course, the metta uh, gives us a subject, a subject for variety, right? So that if 
you're, you're usually practicing with the body or with the breath, you now have another method that you can use from time to time. And I often, uh, well, I always use metta if I remember in the morning when I wake up. Normally at that time I want to get up and start to meditate. <coughs> I don't always recite phrases of loving kindness, but I usually do before sleep. And this is a really nice way to end the day because it helps with deep sleep. Uh, sometimes the body just doesn't want to sleep for one reason or another. But um, generally speaking, if you make the metta a habit in the morning and especially at night, then you tend to have pleasant dreams. The Buddha lists these as some of the benefits. You tend to sleep deeply and wake up refreshed. So even last night I didn't sleep so well, but today I feel pretty good and energized nevertheless because it's just so lovely to share about subjects like loving kindness and meditation and to feel that kind of warmth growing amongst the group. So it really refreshes the mind, not only in sleep, but during the day. Simply by keeping those negative states that drain us so much, especially anger, um, keeping them further away so obviously it's an antidote to ill will and to fear and also I think anxiety because anxiety is something that's very common and probably not always evident as a fear-based or a aversion-based state and yet it's quite hard to be with and loving kindness can soften us around that. It can help us to meet that anxiety with softness and with a sense of resilience because the nature of something like anxiety is that it makes you anxious right you feel anxious you really believe there's a cause and a reason to be anxious but the loving kindness lets that be too and allows us to just have space around it which is very freeing and maybe it even enables us to be in the world even though we're afraid you know sometimes people think you have to be um fearless to do things like, I don't know, sit here and give a talk. But it's not so much that you have to be without fear, it's more about feeling it and yet being at ease with it enough to show up. You know, just like I shared about my experience in Perth when I was suffering a lot of anxiety, which was unusual for me, but it went on for a few weeks, sometimes daily. I was having a lot of anxiety coming up and I had to be around people, uh, at least some of the time by then. and. Uh, I just realized it's okay, you know? And the more I would show up and just be real and just be authentic about how I was feeling, the less daunting that was and the less the anxiety was a problem at all. So I think there's an aspect of loving kindness that also really gives us resilience. And that's a little bit connected to this um, aspect of loving kindness, kind of widening the mind, giving our mind that sense of, um, width and breadth and depth perhaps like the big lake so that when that salt crystal plops into the lake it hardly has any effect so hopefully uh, you can make this meta practice a part of your life as i was saying before some people take it as their main practice but even if you don't i think it's important to sometimes dedicate time to loving kindness maybe at the beginning of a sit as a preparation for other kinds of meditation or just a way to bring some joy to the mind. Maybe, you know, for whole retreats. I've done at least two or three whole retreats on metta um, and that continuity is wonderful. You start to really get, get a sense of the potential of these practices that way. And then that does feed into every other practice because again, the practice of metta feeds into the intention of metta and makes it much, much easier to have um, a sort of friendly disposition in general. So the Buddha says again, you know, that whatever we frequently reflect and ponder upon becomes the inclination of the mind. It also starts to become our character, you know, because the way the mind inclines is the way we grow in a way, it's who we turn out to be. So it starts to become just a natural way of being in the world. And of course, it doesn't mean you'll never get upset or irritated, but it won't last as long and it won't have such an impact in a mind of metta. So we also have some online sits in metta with our um, Zoom community, many of whom are here on the screen and also a few of you are here in the room. 
Uh, so we do that whenever I have time on a Saturday morning usually. You might find other groups that, where you can go and practice loving kindness or you might just find that your mind is so still and so full of loving kindness that it's easy for you to meditate with the breath or whatever else you want to meditate with. So I hope that some of this has been useful and um, that's all the input from me for now. And uh, we now have our last uh, quiet meditation. I thought we'll make it a silent one because uh, you all know what to do and you all have different ways of practicing at different times. So I thought we could sit quietly together for this session and then have some walking meditation. Yep, if you need to go out to the loo, you can. No tea if possible, so that we can start fairly promptly. And uh, there'll be some walking meditation after a while. So I'll we'll sit for about 40, 45 minutes. Yeah, that good?
So we're coming close to the end of the meditation. Just invite you to savor any peace, any calm you experience, any joy. Just really relaxing into that. a few more moments. Maybe noticing a few breaths, infusing the breath with peace. And if you wish, at the end of the three rings of the gong, you may gently open your eyes and smile, please. <laughs> and we'll do some working meditation. So just listening to the rings of the bells. And you know the routine there. <laughs> you back here about 25 past four. Be a bell about that time.